Good day, everybody. This is Chris. I'm back again with the Ancient Scholar, and this is going to be COVID-19 video three, current as of 17 March 2020. Okay, welcome back. And what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some of the basic diagnostic implications for COVID-19, and this is going to be more healthcare provider specific. So let's talk about the major symptoms. Just remember, signs are a, a typically objective findings that we can uh, see, feel, touch, observe, and symptoms are um, typically going to be concepts that a patient reports to us. So what are the major symptoms of COVID-19? Unfortunately, the major symptoms of COVID-19 are very similar to the major symptoms seen in influenza and even just a, a quote-unquote common cold or an uncomplicated upper respiratory um, infection, but there are a few specific things that we want to focus in on. Um, so approximately 70 to maybe 85% of patients will present with a cough, and this is often a dry or a non-productive cough. So a non-productive cough uh, in susceptible population with the potential exposure history, um, and in the coming days and weeks, uh, everyone might likely be exposed. Uh, so this is going to, exposure history is going to be less and less specific. Um, number two, fever. Fever is extraordinarily common. It's seen in, you know, 45 to 50% of patients who have it and, and much greater percentage of patients that are actually demonstrating other symptoms. Um, so dry cough, fever, uh, approximately 20 to 40% of patients with COVID-19 uh, will also have complaints of dyspnea. And a smaller portion, approximately 10%, will have gastrointestinal complaints, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, and this is not commonly seen in other kinds of respiratory, like influenza and upper res other upper respiratory infections. Now, we can also see kind of a biphasic presentation with COVID-19. And uh, generally what you'll see is approximately 5 to 14 days following exposure, we'll have the initial onset. Of signs and symptoms, so you'll have a typically have a prodromal phase, uh, which is very similar to a standard uh, upper respiratory infection with a sore throat, some myalgia or generalized muscle pain, malaise, just not feeling great, um, and uh, that can progress to more of these dry coughing, fever, and then in many cases, or at least some cases, the patients will tend to get better. They'll feel better for a period of a few days, and then they will enter another phase where they begin developing progressive dyspnea. Uh, that's difficulty breathing. They can't catch their breath. They feel like they're at really high altitude. Uh, they have activity intolerance, and that may occur several days after these, these, these major symptoms develop. Um, so they may have kind of like a little convalescence period um, and then a few days later, they will kind of develop this second phase of these more serious uh, signs and symptoms. So that's kind of the history that we see. We look at the vital signs. The vital signs are going to more or less be typical vital signs that we see in patients that present with uh, infections. Their heart rate may be elevated. The respiratory rate may be elevated. Their temperature is often going to be elevated. And depending on how severe the manifestations are of the disease, you may see a low uh, pulse oximetry reading, right? Generally something less than 94% on room air. And this, of course, can be complicated by the fact that you're, you have lots of people that have chronic lung disease that may have a baseline low um, pulse oximetry reading to begin with. So you've got to take the patient's uh, past medical history into consideration as well. And of course, we know patients that have a history of advanced age, immunocompromise, um, you know, uh, severe underlying medical problems such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, chronic respiratory disorders, uh, immunosuppressive medications, those kinds of things are going to be at higher risk in general. Okay, so those are the major signs and symptoms and kind of the clinical presentation that we see. Uh, so let's say that uh, clinically someone's presenting like they may have COVID-19. Uh, what about uh, other more uh, complex diagnostics? Well, let's talk about labs, so blood work. Uh, so if we draw an ABG, the, the thing that we're really going to be really concerned about is hypoxemia, right? 
uh, low oxygen levels. So their, uh, their uh, SAO2, their ar arterial saturation may be low, their PaO2, their partial pressure of um, oxygen may be low. And there is also something called the PF ratio. This is a common respiratory calculation we can do. It is the PaO2 divided by the FiO2. And if that value is generally less than about 300, that is problematic. And the lower that value is, the more compromised the patient's ability to have oxygen diffuse across the alveolar capillary membrane is. And PF ratio is, a, is one of the indicators for someone potentially developing ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is kind of the life, one of the life-threatening manifestations of COVID-19. What are some other labs? So when we look at our uh, CBC, our complete blood count, just to review, CBC, is, the major components of CBC are the white count, the hemoglobin, the hematocrit, and the platelets. Uh, so what do we see? Well, it is more common to see a normal or even low white blood count, right? So if you have someone that presents with a febrile syndrome and their white blood count is low, uh, that is a red flag that you may be dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, so it doesn't have a typical or classic bacterial pneumonia-like appearance uh, laboratory-wise. Uh, the platelet uh, count uh, can be low as well. Uh, when we look at the uh, basic metabolic panel, just to review you, that is uh, the sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, venous CO2, BUN, creatinine, and glucose. Uh, typically, we will see uh, modest to severe elevations in the BUN and creatinine, depending on how impacted the, how negatively impacted or adversely impacted the kidneys may be. Uh, when we look at the liver function tests, so the LFTs, we tend to see elevations in LFTs as well. The total bilirubin, the AST, and the ALT will all be uh, potentially be elevated. Um, a big one that we run into is a procalcitonin, and uh, this might help us differentiate. Uh, bacterial from viral issue. Uh, typically, in COVID-19 patients, they can have normal to even low procalcitonin levels. Uh, that is not characteristically seen in other kinds of uh, pneumonias. Uh, often, the procalcitonin level may be elevated with bacterial pneumonia. So, uh, low procalcitonin is more evidence that we may be dealing with COVID-19. The uh, C-reactive protein and other inflammatory markers may be elevated. The D-dimer may be elevated as well. So none of these by themselves point to COVID-19, but when you take the clinical presentation and the more labs that you have that suggest COVID-19, right, leukopenia, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, elevated BUN and creatinine, elevated LFTs, a low prosocount, pro calcitonin, the more evidence you have pointing to, toward COVID-19, the more and more confident you can be that you may be dealing with someone that has COVID-19. Um, radiology, radiology is a really big one. Uh, so radiologically, these patients can have very uh, classic or characteristic presentations associated with COVID-19. Uh, when we just look at your standard chest film, these patients tend to have bilateral, this is a big thing, bilateral findings, right? So they look like they have bilateral pneumonia, specifically in the periphery. The periphery tends to be involved, impacted significantly. So bilateral, peripheral, hazy, consolidated areas. You can get air bronchograms as well. Um, and this is bilateral. This is not like your classic unilateral lower lobe pneumonia that then, then, uh, then, gets worse over time, right? These patients tend to have bilateral pathology um, when it comes to radiology. Uh, CT scans can be helpful. These patients can develop a quote unquote ground glass appearance. So they can have a very ARDS-like picture. But again, uh, bilateral pneumonia and ARDS-like pictures are very common in these patients. Um, however, in many cases, they may not develop the classic ARDS picture where your your plateau pressures are super high and you have this really low compliance condition um, that you can see with certain kinds of ARDS. These patients tend to then get very wet lung sounds um, and the, the, the airway pressures may not be as elevated as you see in other kinds of ARDS cases. These can have kind of a weird presentation. It's still ARDS. They still have 
trouble oxygenating or they're hypoxemic um, for sure or potentially. Uh, but the, the, the clinical picture is just a little different. Uh, ultrasound uh, is very, can be very important. You're going to see uh, consolidations, curly A and B lines on your radiology. But going back to ultrasound, consolidations, uh, thickened pleural lining is common. And again, this is bilateral. Um, so that's what we tend to see um, on uh, radiology. And this tends to get worse as a patient uh, gets worse. Now again, uh, only about 20% of people with COVID-19 are going to need complex medical care. So of those 20%, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Somebody actually comes, presents to the emergency room uh, or presents to a healthcare setting with concerning signs and symptoms, concerning history, and then we start getting labs. And the more labs that we get back, the more concerned we should be. Um, and that tends to be a problem with these patients is the respiratory failure and even multi-organ failure that can develop. But we'll talk about that more in the treatment of COVID-19. This is just kind of our basic uh, workup. I'll also talk about COVID-19 testing with the PCR probe under uh, the treatment as well. Okay, guys, uh, so hopefully you found this particular section helpful. And uh, as always, I hope you're having a good time doing whatever it is you may be doing, even in spite of uh, what we're dealing with. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.